hymn that <coughs> we'll be singing today is, It Is Well. And the hymn goes like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my Lord thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, the, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. What wonderful words. I don't know if every, everyone knows about the background of this hymn. This was written by Horatio Spafford. And this was written when his wife and four daughters went on a ship. I'm not sure where. And the ship sank and the four daughters passed away and his, only his wife survived. And he penned the song, hit this hymn during that time. And I can't imagine what sort of pain he might have gone through to write this hymn. And if you see the first verse, when peace like a river attendeth my way, it has this great, wonderful visual that, that makes us think of peace and all the and the peace that is, the Lord has given us in our life. If you, uh, I'll just read a verse, Philippians 4, verses 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. My dear brother, as we sing this hymn, whatever be our circumstances, let's think of all the peace that the Lord has given us in our lives, the Prince of Peace, the Lord, may the Lord's name be glorified. be thrown into the midst of the sea.
Well, thanks for that very much. Appreciate that, Wesley. Um, is everyone warm enough? Because I'm conscious there's quite a, a draft blowing through the door there. Please feel free to, to shut the door if you want to do that, because uh, I don't want anybody uh, sort of freezing. <laughs> um, I can feel it at the front there. Uh, it's good to see everyone anyway this morning, and uh, it's good to remember the Lord, isn't it? Just to have him at the centre and the focus of our attention this morning, which is so important. Um, just perhaps mention that uh, a couple of announcements, just in case I forget later on. First of all, I, I spoke to Paul yesterday, uh, and he still isn't well. Um, so perhaps we could pray for him. Uh, they, they, they wondered if it was COVID at one point. They had a COVID test. It's not COVID. Um, and so uh, he, he still doesn't feel any better from what he did last Sunday. So perhaps we can just remember Paul and Margaret at this time. That's why they're not here this morning. Um, it just seems to be one thing after another at the moment. So perhaps remember Paul. Uh, and then just to mention next week, Dave is going to be speaking. Uh, that's right, Dave, isn't it? Yeah, good. Um, so make sure I've got that right. And then, of course, next Sunday is the Sunday we're going to do things a little bit differently in terms of a little bit more structure as we open the service uh, in the morning and then go into a, an open time uh, and then a message at the end. Uh, also to mention that on Wednesday, it's the 1st of September, we're going to be here to meet together for prayer uh, and Bible teaching. I suspect this Wednesday we'll just have a time of prayer, um, really, because it's been a long time since we've gathered together as a church to pray. So if you're free at 8 o'clock on a Wednesday, uh, we're going to be here for that uh, and we'll look forward to, uh, to that occasion. Uh, so I think... Uh, the other thing that was in my mind, actually, Roy, well, is Lena's still in, in, in the States and that. And uh, how's, how's her mum? Is she much the same? Just the same. Okay, right, right. So, so we need to remember Lena and Roy and the family uh, as Lena's mum's not well at all. So we need to, to remember that as well. So. So we will carry on um, our studies uh, in Matthew's Gospel and uh, last week we began to look at a new section. Um, it was that section that deals um, with uh, adultery um, and we're just going to go back to that um, uh, or lust is the other thing you could put, describe that. We're just going to go back to that. Last week we looked at what the issue was, what the problem was. We looked at the importance of marriage, that it was a picture of Christ and his bride, and that's why it's so important to God, that it's right and, and it's genuine, it's real, and it's loyal. Uh, and remember we were saying that when we look with lust, it's, we're not being loyal. We're committing adultery as far as God is concerned if we look with lust. Uh, and we just... Uh, uh, looked at that last week now unfortunately there wasn't a recording of that because uh the ipad didn't record it for some reason um but there we are uh so i can't refer you to that but we're just going to pick up really from uh where we left off last week and we're going to read from matthew chapter 5 um we'll, we'll just read the whole section again matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 21 you have heard that it was said to those of old sorry Verse 27, I do apologize, from verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. And so uh, that's the passage, and it's a passage obviously we need to think about, we need to talk about and understand what it's meaning for us today, um, because it sounds pretty drastic, doesn't it? It sounds pretty drastic. Then just thinking about the problem, what is this look? Um, I think it's worth clarifying what this look is uh, in relation to uh, this whole subject and this whole situation. When we look with lust, then we commit adultery in our hearts as far as God is concerned. But you know, uh, that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because there is a look. We can't help but look, we can't help but see, uh, 
And God has created within his creation these aspects of our humanity that as men and as women, we do look and we do see things which are attractive to us, and that is part and parcel of our creation. And that is how uh, a boy sees a girl. And remember last week we emphasized that marriage is one man and one woman uh, for life, and that the one plus one equals one. That's God's maths when it comes to relationship. One man, one woman for life. So when a, a man uh, or a boy, a young lad, sees a girl and he, he finds her attractive because she looks beautiful. And he's drawn to her and he's attracted to her. And that is part of God's creation in relation to uh, this thing. And that is right and that is normal. And that is beautiful. And God has created those things. God is a God who's created uh, sex. He's created uh, that beautiful thing to exist between a man, a husband and a wife, man and a woman, husband and wife, who are married and are united and who become one. Uh, and that's the context in which uh, there is attraction uh, between a man and a woman. So the Bible's not teaching against that attraction within a marriage in a marriage context, the Bible is teaching here when a man is looking at someone else's wife and then is drawn with a lustful look. And what do we mean by that? Well, sometimes it's helpful to think of that as the second look. Maybe you're going along and you see, uh, and it is particularly an issue for men, isn't it? Uh, I think that's reality, although women are affected by these things as well. Um, a, a man goes along and he sees a girl who he finds uh, who, who's pretty uh, and um, he can't help that. That's just something we see. That's the world in which we live. Otherwise, you have to go around with a blindfold. <laughs> you couldn't drive a car with a blindfold, could you? <laughs> That's life. So wherein is the problem? Where does this become a problem? This becomes a problem when we, if you like, take the second look for the purpose of gratifying the lust of the flesh, for the purpose of gratifying our uh, desires, our carnal desires, to take pleasure in that look. And that is what this passage is talking about, the second look that looks to lust, that looks to gratify the lust of the flesh. Remember when we're saved, we still have a fallen nature. Lust is still working in us and is part and parcel of us. And so the Lord is teaching that, you know, it's possible to look with lust and not to know the name of the person, where that person lives or anything about them, but to commit adultery with them because you looked with lust. You looked to gratify your lustful pleasure pleasure and, and desires uh, that exist in us carnally which are part of that fallen nature and that's what this scripture is talking about is not to do that and remember last week we said as married men we should have eyes for one woman alone and that is our wife or wives to have eyes for one man alone that is your husband and then we also said that we should have one woman or one man in our minds and that is our wife or our husband and really, anything outside of that is not right, is not acceptable. We shouldn't be thinking about others uh, other than our wife or our husband. So this is a, a look to lust. That's what this is. And you know, we live in a society that makes it very difficult, don't we? And we have to say this, and I'm going to say this. We live in a society that makes it really difficult because the standards of dress in our society uh, are on, on a downward uh, although recently uh, I, I did hear about a, a fashion trend which is growing, which is, is the opposite in the opposite direction, and that's encouraging. <laughs> but we've lived in a society where basically uh, it has been uh, that people are dressing immodestly and want to flaunt their body, uh, and the fashion industry seems to relish this whole concept of, of, of causing, bringing in fashion that uh, enc encouraging the flaunting of the body. That is not right, okay? That is not right. Now, you'd expect me to say this. So, fellas, you shouldn't be looking with lust, but, ladies, you should dress with modesty. 
so not dressing in a way that would draw a attention to uh, your, your body and uh, you would expect me to say that but yet at the same time uh, by all means be fashionable okay be fashionable <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily a good thing for uh, Christian women and men not to be fashionable uh, because we look um, yeah well we, we, we don't want to go down the route of the Amish do we <laughs> uh, we want to be uh, looking good uh, and that's right but it's just that modesty aspect of, of how we look. Okay, so let's then think about the solution because if we're truthful with ourselves and we need to be truthful, this is a problem we all have, okay? This is a problem that all men have and all potentially women can have, okay? But it's a bigger problem for men. This is something that we all have dealt with. And as I look back over my life, and I want to say this in case there's any here who feel that they're alone in this, I have struggled in this area. And I would be telling a lie if I said I didn't. Okay? So, look and listen, this isn't a problem you alone have got. And yet the Bible gives us some instruction in relation to how we deal with it. And that's where I want to focus this morning, our attention, uh, to be very practical um, about this subject and to look at how we can overcome this problem of lusting with our eyes uh, and... Uh, see see what, what the solution is there for us so basically we've read in our passage together matthew 5 29 to 30 it outlines for us um, uh, the solution that the lord jesus is teaching in relation to this subject of looking with lust verse 29 says and this is the nlt so if your eye even your good eye causes you to lust gouge it out and throw it away it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for you to hold to your whole body to be thrown into hell. And you, you're thinking to yourself, you what? <laughs> this is one of those passages that people read and think, you're joking, aren't you? <laughs> what, gouge my eye out and throw it away? Does the Lord Jesus mean that? No, this is figurative speaking. This is figurative language. This is not literal. I'll tell you why it's not literal, because if you gouged your eye out and threw it away, you'd have a problem with your other eye. <laughs> you'd have to take both eyes out, and then you've still got an imagination. So that, this is not literal. This is figurative language. And it, the idea here, the Lord Jesus is teaching, if there's something in your life that's causing you to offend, to trip up, to fall into that is cut it off cut it off that's the idea many years ago i watched a film as a christian film called fireproof i don't know whether i think that's the name of it anybody else has seen that it's a very practical film it was about a man um, who was struggling in this whole area of looking with lust uh, and he had marriage problems as a result of this and oh everything was going wrong and the film was how basically how he comes to know the lord uh, how he becomes a christian uh, and then how he deals with this problem in his life. And you, you, you basically see this image, and, and it was an old PC. It was, must have been, the film must have been made back in the 90s because it was a big, chunky PC with a big, chunky monitor. And you see him going outside in his garden and getting a hammer and smashing his PC uh, because this was the thing that was causing him to cause, to be offended, and that he was looking at pictures on the internet, on his computers, that were, were not good and were not wholesome, and he was practicing that principle of, of cutting this thing off. Uh, and we're going to talk about that, some practical ideas in relation to that. So it's figurative language and not thing. So what we want to do is just pick up on the example of someone like King David. So King David had this problem. We read about it in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 5. And use King David's example of to draw some lessons out for us to help us to avoid these situations where we might find ourselves falling in this area. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verses 1 to 5 and it says this, In the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Amorites. They destroyed the Amorites' army and laid siege on the city of Rabbah However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, God, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. 
He sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David sent messengers to her to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after her usual menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. This is King David. This is the lad the man who wrote the Psalms, many of the Psalms. A man who has a heart after God and he's making these terrible mistakes. And so we need to be aware. If we think we stand, if we think we've got this issue sorted, if we think we've arrived, let us be on our guard. We need to be very, very careful in relation to this whole area. Because if David can fall like this, so can any of us. And so what are the lessons we can learn from this? Well, first of all, we notice that David was not where he should have been. He was not where he should have been. He should have been with his army, fighting the Amorites on the front line, and instead he had stayed at home. He was unoccupied. He was idle. He was doing his own thing while his soldiers were out fighting. He was, was not where he should have been. And lesson number one is this, we need to be careful that we avoid idle time. We need to avoid idle time. When we've got time on our hands, when we've got nothing to do, when we're not occupied, when we're not busy, then our minds can wander, our eyes can wander, uh, and we find ourselves in situations where we're more in more temptation then that at any other time, and I'm talking from my own experience, as I look back over my own life and where I've struggled in these areas, it's often times of inactivity, times when I'm not busy, times when I wasn't doing what, something that I should have been doing. Beware of those times. Avoid time uh, being idle uh, and, and keep yourself busy for the Lord, busy in your work, busy, busy, busy. Uh, and time alone uh, as well is another issue. Um, if we're alone and we're idle, those are risky times. Those are dangerous times, okay? Um, so stay connected to community. Stay around people. Stay where people are as much as you possibly can and avoid being alone and idle. Um, get involved with other groups of people, whatever it might be, in whatever situation, circumstances. Uh, be aware of those danger times. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, we think of that in relation to uh, ourselves at home. Um, and we will think about how we can ensure that we're not spending times alone, uh, but keep amongst the family if you can, uh, keep engaged uh, in, in, in with people around you. Because, as I say, what Satan wants to do is one of his strategies in relation to bringing people down is to isolate them, to get them alone. If he can get you alone, doing your own thing, in, with a, an idle outset, then he will start to work on your mind. He can plant thoughts in your mind. He can cause you to see things that start the thought process that lead on to sinful practice. Point C, then, is avoid secrets, okay? Avoid secrets. Um, David was alone. He was at home. He, he, he should have been in, in battle. He was alone on the top of his palace and he was looking out, time alone, by himself. And now he's looking out and in his time alone looking out, he sees uh, Bathsheba. Um, and this was his secret. This was his little thing. If he hadn't been alone on that rooftop looking out over the city, he wouldn't have seen Bathsheba and therefore he wouldn't have looked with lust and allowed that look of lust to turn into a desire that caused him to invite her and then to carry out the sinful act that he carried out with her and then ultimately led to him murdering her husband and by the way uh, as Alison pointed out to me you know his his actions towards Bathsheba were very dishonorable 
He had the power. He was the king. He determined what she had to do. And that's serious. So not only was he guilty of looking with lust and committing adultery, uh, but he was also guilty of rape. And he was guilty of murder. And he was guilty of lying. And notice how his sin just goes down and down and down and down. And he's not even aware of it. That's the saddest thing of all. It takes Nathan the prophet to come and make him aware of that thing. So here he is. He's alone. He's on the rooftop. He's looking out. And it's, it's a secret for him, isn't it? He's doing his own thing. There's lots of things going, wrong here, going around here which shouldn't be going around. And so the other point I'd make in this respect is avoid secrets. Avoid secrets, okay? Um, secrets are not of God. Secrets are not of God. Uh, they are dangerous, and they can lead to sinful practices. As husbands, avoid secrets. Don't have something that's yours and yours alone. You are one with your wife. Share what you have with your wife. Not a good idea to have my draw. This is my draw. You stay out of that. That's mine. That's my business. That's my desk. You stay out of that. That's my phone. My iPhone. iPhones, of course, are smartphones. I'm using iPhone. It's Apple, isn't it? A bit of advertising for Apple there. No, I mean smartphones, of course. Our potential for us to fall in this way, aren't they? To see images on there, to get images on there to keep images on there that can cause us to fall in this area, okay? And it's possible that we have our phones and we keep them secret. This is my phone. No one else gets to look at that. It's got a password on it. It's mine. It's secret. Don't do that. Make yourself accountable to someone somewhere. Husbands, let your wives see your phones, your smartphones. Make sure your wife knows your password so that she can regularly go through your phone, as Alison does with mine. I'm not speaking from experience. She gives me no choice anyway. <laughs> She'll get the phone. She'll have a look at it. <laughs> That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing that she looks through my texts and she sees who I'm texting. She sees, she sees who I'm WhatsApping. She can look through my pictures. And she has access. And I need that. I need accountability. I need to avoid situations where it's secret, it's private to me. So be open. Don't have secrets. And tell your wife, tell your husband your secrets. You're one. As a couple, you're one. There shouldn't be any secrets between husband and wife. Be open and honest. And make yourself accountable to your partner. Um, because if that partner loves you as undoubtedly as you will or he does, they will understand and they will help you in this area because it's an area of temptation. Uh, and so we should be willing to be accountable. Well, as our children were growing up, uh, we always had the PC in, in the front room so that they uh, weren't able to access anything out, out of the sight of others. Now, I know things have changed rapidly from when our children were growing up because I know they all have their phones and their smartphones and all the rest of it. And, and so we just need to think about how we account ourselves for that. Make yourself accountable to someone, your mum, your dad, your, your, your husband, your wife. Be willing to let them see your phone. Uh, and you can get accountability software these days. Uh, if you're struggling in this area, and you know what? I know how easy it is as I've grown up, as I've been a young man, and as I've been even a middle-aged man and an older man. I know the temptation myself. Don't think you're alone in this. You're not. But you need to get help uh, and you need to do something about that. Um, why do you need to get help? Um, because if we don't get help, if we don't check this, if we don't deal with this problem of looking and lusting, it doesn't go away. And the work that we're involved in at the mill is very much helping lads who are uh, struggling with issues of addiction. Uh, and it won't surprise you to know that uh, looking with lust, looking at, at uh, things which are not wholesome and good, can actually become an addiction. It's an addiction because when you look, chemicals are released into your brain, pleasure chemicals which are released into your brain, and your brain becomes addicted to them. 
and unfortunately it doesn't just stop there. So you start with mild things and then the brain pushes you for deeper and deeper things um, because of the addictive nature of it. And some of the fellas we've worked with over the years have ended up in trouble with the police because of this very problem. What went wrong? They didn't know where to stop. They couldn't stop. They couldn't help themselves. Because this thing sucks you in and it takes you deeper and deeper and deeper and then one day, the day came when they clicked on the wrong website and the next thing they know, police are knocking on the door. And again, we have a few guys at the mill for whom that has happened. Uh, and so, you know, be aware. Uh, and so, there is a solemn aspect to this. Make yourself accountable so people can see where you're at and uh, make a covenant with your eyes. Um, and that is that you will not look at things which are not right and wholesome. Job 31 verse 1, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. Um, the second look, so, so, so that, that is, that is the, a verse to take on board, to make it your own. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust at a young woman. Job 31 verse 1, um, it's the second look that's the look of lust. Uh, we can't help but see things. But when we see those things, we've made a covenant with our eyes. We're not going to continue to look with us. We're going to turn away. We're going to switch the phone off. We're going to get rid of that thing that's causing us offense. We're going to make ourselves accountable to someone, someone who's looking. We're going to get rid of anything that we have, any materials, any magazines, any pictures. We're going to cut them off. We're going to throw them out. We're going to have a clean out. We're going to clean out our video library. We're going to clean out our DVD library to bring it a little bit more up to date. And we're going to clean out anything that we have stored anywhere that's offensive, that causes me to lust when I look at it. Cut it off and get rid of it. Make a covenant with your eyes. Be determined before the Lord that you will walk with the Lord. Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Put off the old way and put on the new. Ephesians 4, 20, 24. But that isn't what you learn about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And so we need to allow our minds to be renewed. The renewing of the mind comes through reading the word. So instead of looking at these things that cause us offence and cause us to trip up, substitute that time, that effort with reading the word. Read, read, read. Keep reading the word. It's the re reading of God's word renews our minds. The Holy Spirit is able to use the word of God to refresh our minds, to clean our minds, to create an environment which is, is wholesome. Now then, don't despair, okay? Don't despair. If you're struggling with these things, if you're finding it difficult, if you're struggling in this area, you're not alone. Many people do. And so what do you need to do? Cut off the thing that's offending you and then start reading God's word regularly. Start the day with God's word and any opportunity you get, read the word of God. And the word of God is like a, a clean water. You think of a big stagnant pool of water. And our minds are a little bit like that. Over things that we've seen and heard over the years. A big stagnant pool of water. And if you take a hose pipe to that pool uh, and you put that hose pipe in at one end, eventually uh, the water will flow out at the other end. And if that happens for long enough, if you keep the pure, clean water flowing in, flowing in, flowing in, all the bad stuff flows out the other side. And if you make a habit of reading your Bible and praying every day, we talked about that recently, 
and allow your mind to be flooded with God's word, reading God's word, thinking about what you're reading, thinking about the word of God, it cleans the mind, it renews the mind, it freshens the mind, and it will enable you to walk in the spirit. It will enable you not to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You will gain a new victory as you're trusting Christ and you're looking to Christ uh, to meet you in your need. And that's a, a, a great thing. Uh, how do you know that? Because I've seen that happen. It works. But we need to take drastic action to cut off the thing that offends us and replace it. Don't create a vacuum, but replace it with God's word. Consistent, regular work, reading of God's word, thinking on the word of God, and it cleanses us, it cleanses our minds. Okay. So then, first of all, the, 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 sorry, the next point to say is that be aware of the cycle that comes about in relation to sin. Um, James 1 verse 15 says, Then desire, when it conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's the cycle of sin. So desire, a lustful desire, which may come about as a result of seeing something. We see something, we look with lust, it sows a thought, and if we don't deal with that thought, that thought will uh, fester in our heads and ultimately it will lead us to sin and to sin and to sin. Look at David's situation. One sin leading to another sin, leading to another sin, leading to another sin, and the sin was getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So if we're going to avoid this problem, we need to cut off that cycle. We need to break that link. And we either doing that, we do that by stopping the lustful look, making a covenant with our eyes to turn away, not to look. Something comes on television that's going to cause you to look with lust. Switch it off. You learn the television programs that are of that nature. Switch it off. If there's some website you go to or something that might be a problem, you don't go there anymore. You don't pull up that website anymore. YouTube and social media, sadly, are increasingly becoming the means by which the enemy is using to corrupt and pollute people. Be very careful. And sometimes they will come across in, in, in easy ways and, and general interest things which are absolutely fine and not harmful at all. And then something will be thrown up and, and we're drawn into it. So we need to be really, really careful. Those, cut off those things that are causing us defense. Uh, and I'm not saying you, you, don't, you, you don't use the internet. Some of us have to use it in our jobs. Some of us use it for good. And we draw down ministry and Bible teaching and we get help from it and whatever. We, we are in a world where we have to do that. We have to have smartphones. I'm not saying you, you, you uh, necessarily have to cut those things and not have them. Although some people do because it's such a problem. Um, but you learn to use them and you learn to put the Lord first. And you learn, learn to, to draw from the Lord rather than drawing from other things. So break that cycle of sin. Uh, stop the lustful look. And if the lustful look comes in, stop the thought. When a, a lustful thought comes into your mind, directly think about something else. So one of the things that I've done down through the years is a lustful thoughts come into my mind, maybe because of something I've seen. And immediately, that trigger, we call it a trigger, that trigger kicks into place an action which I know I must do. And it's this, I start giving thanks to the Lord for the cross. I just say, Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for what you've done for me. Even though that thought is in your head, just, just pray that. Lord, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for what the Lord Jesus has done for me. Or think on a verse. Be ye holy as I am holy is one of the verses that I've used down through the years. Um, present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable act of worship. And use a verse, pray to the Lord, and you will be amazed at how quickly you can divert that negative, lustful thought that's come through something you've seen uh, to, a, uh, to something that's good, and, and, and you break that cycle. Don't let it go any further. Don't let it stay in your mind. Don't let it fester there, because it will lead to sin. It will draw you into sin. And then it's learning to 
uh, draw from the Lord Jesus. It's learning to l- draw from living water. Just fi- finish off with this. Um, where is the problem often in our Christian lives is we're not drinking from the right place. You know, we all have a thirst, and it's a thirst that only God can satisfy. And yet we live our lives in such a way as to satisfy that thirst in all sorts of different ways. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones? Even though they are not gods at all, yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord, for my people have done two evils. What have they done? They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. And I say to you this morning, well, just as we're drawing this to an end, where are you drinking from? Where are you drinking from? Where are you trying to fill, fulfill your inner thirst, your inner appetite from? We're all guilty of going to false gods, to idols, to satisfy that longing, that inner thirst, that inner desire. And some people will try idols of covetousness, of uh, lustful thoughts and looks. And some people will try and fulfill satisfaction from their business and success in business and uh, some people will try to fulfill it from education and all sorts of different areas, sometimes legitimate things that become idols in our lives. And yet the only place we're ever going to be satisfied, uh, satisfy that thirst is from the Lord. And we drink of his living water that he provides for us, which comes to us through the Holy Spirit and the word of God. And as we drink deep of Christ, rather than other things, Our thirst will be satisfied. And the desire for these other things, lustful looks and all of that, will be taken away. And we'll know a victory. We can live in victory over this. We can. We'll know a victory when we're walking in the Spirit, when we've put off the old and put on the new, when we're drinking from those fountains of living waters that comes to us through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit enfolding the Word of God to us. Uh, And that's really where we want to be as the people of God. Well, uh, as always with these times, these occasions, there's so much we could say, and our time has gone. So we're just going to uh, stop there. That we'll, we'll finish at that particular section, and then next week, uh, Dave will be uh, either moving on to a new section, or he, he will be uh, doing uh, another subject. We'll leave that with him. Let's just pray. Lord, we just give thanks and praise this morning for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, encouragement it is to us, but also we think of the challenge it brings to us this morning, and uh, we are challenged by these things, Lord. We know uh, that we're prone to failure, and so we pray for your help day by day to walk with the Lord, to walk in your ways, to draw and drink from that fountain of living water rather than drinking Uh, from other sources which will never satisfy. So, Lord, we pray for your help in these things today uh, as we do just commit everyone here to you. We pray for Paul and Margaret, uh, and we pray, Lord, for Edna this morning in all of her need, and ask, Lord, that you would undertake uh, in every way for us. Think of Barbara, who's away as well, and ask these things now in Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen. Yes, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're at the back there now. Please do take the opportunity to have a look. Uh, it's important that we do things decently, openly, and honestly. Uh, Ian does a great job of, of doing all the accounts for us and then they are audited as well so we're very thankful to Ian for that so uh, please uh, take opportunity to have a look at that.